chapter 20. And chapter 20 deals with uh, infections that target the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems. The problem with the infe any infection that occurs in either one of these systems is that they then can easily hit your ride throughout these systems and get all over the body. Okay? So we often consider these systemic, which means they can become system-wide relatively quickly. Okay? And what that ultimately means is they're often relatively serious infections. Okay? Um, but the good news is, is that our body, in particular the immune system, is very well um, established in these areas. And it's designed to prevent infections before they actually occur in the system. Okay? So they're relatively rare, but when they do happen, they're pretty nasty. So a little bit about the cardiovascular and lymphatic system. So the cardiovascular system is a closed uh, circulatory system that, composed, that is composed of arteries and veins, as well as a muscular organ known as the heart that pumps blood around the body. Okay? The primary purpose of the cardiovascular system is to transport oxygen and nutrients to all the cells and tissues in the body, as well as remove carbon dioxide and waste products. Okay? So as you can imagine, if an organism did wiggle its way into the cardiovascular system, this could obviously then allow the organism to get all over and all these little nooks and crannies where it shouldn't be. Okay? The lymphatic system, which we talked pretty heavily about in chapters 14 and 15, is a series of vessels and nodes that runs parallel to primarily the, the major veins in the body. Okay? Again, its primary purpose is to collect extra cellular fluid, as well as allow for immune cells to migrate around the body. And obviously, if you get an infection in here, it then allows the organism to get you know, pretty quickly throughout the body and cause subsequent disease. So again, cardiovascular system is designed to move blood around in a closed circuit. It's closed by design so that nothing can easily get into it. Okay? Um, by closed, I mean it's you know, completely lined with endothelial cells. No liquid can get in or get out unless the body decides that that's what it wants to do. And again, its primary purpose is to transmit oxygen and nutrients, as well as carry away carbon dioxide and waste products. Lymphatic system, series of vessels and nodes, pretty much runs parallel to the major cardiovascular veins. And again, it's there to filter impurities and infectious agents and give the immune cells somewhere to kind of move around in the community. As far as defenses are concerned in both the cardiovascular and lymphatic system, there are a lot of them. Okay? And this is a double-edged sword. Right? So you have a lot of immune cells in the bloodstream and in the lymphatic system. In fact, the majority of your immune cells are going to be found here. And so that means there's a lot of guys there to fight an infection if it does occur. Okay? But if an infection does eventually take hold in either the cardiovascular or lymphatic system, all of these immune cells are there and respond very, very quickly. And usually uh, this results in something called a cytokine storm. That means all of these immune cells become activated very quickly, releasing all these different cytokines and chemokines, and this causes widespread uh, edema, uh, inflammation, leakiness of blood vessels, blood uh, loss, and uh, something called septic shock, which is often life-threatening. Okay? So <clears throat> these systemic infections are well protected, but if an infection does occur, the immune system is actually doing more harm than good in that instance. Now, whenever you have a systemic infection, uh, typically we denote that by having a suffix of emia, E-M-I-A, okay? If it's a virus, this is known as a viremia. If it's a bacteria, it's known as a bacteremia. And if it's a fungus, it's known as a fungaremia, okay? Now, if you have a septicemia, that means you actually have organisms growing within the blood, okay? So a bacteremia could just be organism going in and out of the bloodstream relatively quickly, okay? A septicemia is when you have bacteria going into the blood, staying there, and reproducing and causing disease within the bloodstream. Okay? So generally, septicemia is a much more serious condition because the organisms are going to be more numerous. And again, one of the um, <clears throat> symptoms of having a septicemia is septic shock. And this is, again, due to that overabundant immune uh, response. And this results in cytokine storm hemodynamic collapse, which is where all your blood vessels become leaky, your blood pressure drops significantly, and then you die. Okay. So as far as normal biotic concern, there should not be any. Okay? The bloodstream and the lymphatic system should be relatively sterile. 
However, it is not unusual to find a you know, transient organism in there every now and then. Okay? It's not going to be the end of the world. The ones that are really going to be problematic are going to be the guys, again, that are actively growing and causing disease in either the cardiovascular or lymphatic system, and those are the ones that we're going to talk about today. Now, <clears throat> whenever you have a disease in the cardiovascular system, or infectious disease, I should say, in the cardiovascular system, they oftentimes can be relatively difficult to classify. And the reason for that is, is we primarily classify diseases based on the symptoms. And when you have a cardiovascular infection, oftentimes the symptoms are very dramatic, very intense, and pretty much the same for all different types of bacteria. Because again, you're getting that same really robust immune response. And because it's spread out all over the body, it's hard to say, oh, it started here or it started there. Okay? It can be really hard to di uh, differentiate one from another. So we're going to start off with endocarditis. And endocarditis is the inflammation of the endocardium. Okay? The endocardium is the smooth tissue lining the inside of the heart. Okay? The heart valves and the interior chambers. Now, if you happen to get an infection uh, with uh, bacterial organisms in the bloodstream, and you have some sort of scarring or buildup of plaque or material in your heart, then the organism can actually get deposited on that scar tissue or plaque, and then they can start to form a biofilm, and this is what starts endocarditis. Okay? This endocarditis causes inflammation, scarring to develop, and eventual valve damage and potential failure. Um, now, there are acute and subacute varieties. Acute tend to occur when you uh, go under the knife and you get some sort of contaminant into your bloodstream. Okay? These are often life-threatening okay? and can kill you in a couple of weeks. Subacute are the kind that you get exposed to due to maybe a, um, a cut or maybe some sort of oral surgery or, or dental work. Organism gets into the bloodstream, it then slowly starts to grow biofilms, and this results in, you know, months and months and months before it develops into a serious endocarditis. Okay. Now, this is relatively difficult to treat, and that's because these biofilms are really hard to penetrate with antibiotics. Also, your immune system really can't focus on them, because every time the immune cells get into the heart, they get pumped back out. So they have no way to go in and actually do their job. Okay. So this means the only real treatment for this is to have open heart surgery, um, scrape away the biofilm and maybe even replace the valves if they're that seriously damaged. It's usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pneumoniae. And again, you have to have these organisms introduced into the blood, and you also have to have plaques or scarring in your, uh, in your heart. Okay? If you have a smooth heart, it, these guys won't stick very well, and it's less likely for this to develop. And this is why if you go and have any kind of uh, dental work done, uh, especially you know cavities and things like that where bleeding can occur, uh, and you have problems with your heart, whether you've had open heart surgery or you've had a lot of plaque and things, they will put you on prophylactic antibiotics to kill the organism before they can establish themselves. So here is an example of a normal heart valve. You can see there's nothing on it. Over here we have a heart valve with endocarditis. And these organisms form sticky biofilms, which are almost impossible for the immune system and antibiotics to get them. <clears throat> septicemias, so as we said before, septicemias are where you have organisms in the blood actively growing, causing disease within the bloodstream. These are often very serious conditions, and they can be caused by many different species of bacteria, okay, primarily. But occasionally they can also be caused by funguses, which we call fungaremia. Generally, bacteria are a little bit more preferable because they don't um, result in death as much. But both of them are very serious conditions, require hospitalization and immediate treatment. Generally, fever is the most prominent symptom, and that's because you have this widespread immune reactivation. And then you'll uh, have altered mental state, shaking chills, gastrointestinal systems, uh, extremely low blood pressure, hemodynamic collapse, and then eventual death if nothing is done. Okay. Now, generally speaking, people who get septicemias are often uh, associated with hospitals and nosocomial infections. And that's because they are usually a little bit weak or sick because they're already in the hospital. And then they also may get exposed to you know, pretty virulent organisms um, because the hospital is full of them. Okay. But generally speaking, it's pretty rare for a healthy individual to get a septicemia. 
Usually it's someone who's immunocompromised or has some other, order, other complication, this becomes like a secondary factor. Okay, next we have plague. And plague is caused by a bacterium known as Yersinia pestis. Okay? Yersinia pestis is a gram-negative rod, and it uses rodents as its reservoir. Okay? So a reservoir is just an animal where the organism can kind of hang out and wait until it can eventually get into a human. Okay? So rodents are the reservoir, and how does it get into humans? Through flea bites. So a flea bites rodent, gets infected with the Yersinia organism, then goes and bites a human, transmits the organism into the human's bloodstream. Okay. This then allows the organism to get into the lymphatic system, and the first thing that develops is something called a bubo. Okay. And this bubo is a large necrotic lymph node that usually occurs in the groin region. Okay. Uh, this tends to be pretty painful, and if this doesn't get treated with antibiotics, then it can move into the bloodstream and then into the lungs. It goes into the bloodstream, it's known as septicemic plague. And if it goes into the lungs, it's known as pneumonic plague. Pneumonic plague is very, very deadly without treatment. It has about a 90% mortality rate. And once it's in the lungs, it then becomes easily transmissible from one person to the next through contaminated uh, aerosolized droplets. Okay. And so this is why historically black plague has been a very important pandemic, because this is what resulted in the Black Death, 6th century AD which killed about 100 million people, or about 25% of the world population. Okay. Um, and again, it's because of its ability to spread from one person to the next through just contaminated aerosolized droplets and have a 90% mortality rate. Now, we don't see plague too much anymore because it's relatively easy for us to quarantine people who are sick so they don't spread it from one person to the next. And antibiotics are also effective against this one. As I said, plague can manifest in a couple different ways. The first type of plague that usually develops is bubonic, and this is where you get infected by a contaminated <laughs> flea. When you get infected by that con uh, contaminated flea, uh, it then causes a bubo, which is a necrotic lymph node, usually in the groin region. And this then can kind of grow and perpetuate inside of this, work its way into the bloodstream, and then eventually into once it's pneumonic, it then can easily be spread from one person to the next, so you no longer need fleas and rodents to continue the disease. And as soon as that, another person gets infected with that pneumonic plague, it goes right to pneumonic. It doesn't start off in the bubo and work its way around. So it becomes that very virulent, uh, deadly form. I thought, like, it was like, I don't know, like, you know, like the ring around the rosy, like it was so when they say like, um, like exactly like ring around a rosy, like it was like a rosy rash or something, not like, not like that was like one of the things. No, I don't know the um, origins of the language that's used in that. The only thing I could think of is, is probably was, you know, Middle English, so it was probably kind of different terminology and what that meant, mm -hmm. but I don't know exactly where that comes from. Oh. Um, but bubo is by far the, the most clinically significant sign. But it, back in the day of the Black Plague, no one knew about the boat. I mean, they couldn't really associate things like that. Um, back in those days, they just thought you'd get it because you were possessed or you, you know, didn't pray hard enough or whatever the case was. Right? So they didn't really know, oh, if I go next to you and you talk on me, I'm going to get this. Uh, it can be hard to kind of you know, draw those lines. Right. That part. All right, so this is just showing you the life cycle of the organism. So as I said, rodents act as kind of a, a reservoir, and flea bites is what allows us to transmit from one rodent to the next. Historically, it was thought that rats were the primary reservoir for, or for plague, at least the black plague. But uh, current studies have shown that it was actually the ground squirrel. Okay? Um, this makes more sense because squirrels are very good at living with humans, and humans don't really care that they're there. Right? Where rats, they try to shoot away. Um, again, fleas become infected. They then can bite a human, this results in pneumonic plague, but eventually if it works to the lungs, it then causes pneumonic plague, which is even more deadly. So pneumonic plague only in males then? No, it's in everyone. I don't know why they drew by his penis, but. <laughs> <laughs> tularemia. So tularemia, also known as rabbit fever, 
is an infection that is very, very similar to plague. Okay? However, instead of rabbits being the, or, or excuse me, instead of rodents being the primary reservoir, it's now lagomorphs or rabbits. Okay? Hence the name rabbit fever. The organism is Franciella tularicinus. This is a highly infectious agent. Okay? And again, it's transmitted through a biological vector. But instead of being a flea, it's often a tick okay? or a, a deer fly. Once it gets in through skin break, then spreads systemically and can cause high grade fever, hence its name, and a potential uh, death. It also does cause a bubo like formation to form, which is again a necrotic lymph node. Um, <clears throat> so, again, that's why it looks fairly similar to plague, and sometimes it gets confused with plague. This does have the potential of becoming a bioterrorist agent, and that's because you can inhale it. Okay? Uh, and then also develop something similar to like a new mom of plague. But the good news is, is when you inhale uh, tularemia, it's not nearly as deadly as new mom of plague. Okay. Um, it's also relatively easy to treat with aminoglycosides or antibiotics. So we don't see this terribly often in, uh, um, really anywhere in the world, but there is always the potential for bioterrorism. There have been a couple cases of people running over rabbits with lawnmowers and then developing this because they aerosolize the blood. Um, so, you know, wild rabbits in particular, I wouldn't, you know, play with unless uh, you want to get to a room. Lyme disease. So, Lyme disease is caused by a Sprelia organism, a Borrelia borgia theory. Okay? And again, this is transmitted through a biological vector, in this case, a deer tick or the Iaxidus. Hopefully you're beginning to see a trend. Most of these are transmitted through biological vectors or insects that have to inject uh, the organism into you. Okay? And again, that's because the cardiovascular and lymphatic system are very, very well protected. Okay? So it's really difficult for these organisms to get into the body unless they get some help. Okay? Rodents act as a reservoir. In fact, almost all deer mice are infected with the Borrelia organism. Okay, it's like a commensal found within them. The deer mouse gets infected uh, <clears throat> by uh, a tick bite. This then uh, infects the tick. Uh, the tick, or excuse me, the, the deer tick gets infected uh, by the mouse. This then results in an infected tick, which then can go bite a human and develop, uh, allow for Lyme disease to develop. One of the tall tale signs of Lyme disease is something called a bullseye rash also known as erythemia migrans. Okay. This radiates out from where the tick bit you, and it can be, you know, feet in diameter in some cases. Okay, so very big kind of red, ringy rash that forms around uh, the, the initial bite site. Now, if you don't get this treated relatively quickly within a couple weeks of infection, this will ultimately result in a very long-term chronic infection. Uh, and that's because the organism has the ability of doing something called antigenic switching. What this means is it constantly changes its surface. Okay? And by doing so, the antibodies your immune system produced to it before are no longer going to be effective to it, and now the immune system has to go back and try to fight it again. Okay? And so it's always kind of one step ahead of the immune system. Now because it does this, oftentimes you can also get an autoimmune response. And that's because some of the antigens that they produce look like antigens that your body produces. So when your immune system responds with antibodies towards this guy, it also cross-reacts with your own uh, bits and pieces. Okay? This can result in arthritis, cardiac problems, and neurological symptoms. Uh, if you don't get it treated early on, it's usually relatively difficult to cure, and you probably will be infected for the rest of your life. Now we typically see this in areas where the deer tick is prevalent, so the Northeast, as well as the Upper Midwest. Okay. Uh, they're very similar to Alzheimer's. So it's kind of like early onset Alzheimer's. No, it's just a similar type of symptom. So anytime you have slow um, pathogenesis in the brain, it usually looks a lot like Alzheimer's because it's all kind of the same. You're destroying tissue very slowly. Same with what we'll talk about with HIV. You get HIV in the brain that turns into kind of an Alzheimer's. Can it be misdiagnosed? 
Uh, yep, definitely. Um, but it's usually something they would look for. So if you're 30 and you develop Alzheimer's or, or symptoms of it, they would say, okay, have you lived in these areas? Let's look to see if you have uh, Borrelia. Pretty easy to test for. Okay, so it is non-fatal, but it does cause a chronic illness that will slowly get worse and worse and worse and develop into these autoimmune-like illness. Okay. <clears throat> Early symptoms, again, are rash at the tick site. And this is a big bullseye rash. It's very distinctive. But keep in mind, not everyone gets this rash. Okay? It's not found in all infections. So if you are in one of the areas where um, uh, Lyme disease is uh, highly prevalent, northeast, upper uh, midwest, you get bit by a tick, save the tick. Okay? It's relatively easy for doctors to look and say, okay, this is the Idixis tick, so it might be Borrelia. And then they can even culture the tick to see if the organism is there. Other symptoms are fever, headache, stiff neck, and dizziness. And then the second stage, this is what results in that autoimmune-like illness, cardiac and neurological issues. Now, when we see tick infections, they tend to occur on a biannual cycle, okay? which means one year there's hardly any Borrelia organisms or Borrelia infections, Lyme disease. And then another year, there's a whole bunch. Okay? And the reason for that is, is that the tick that transmits the Borrelia organism is also on a biannual cycle, or life cycle. Okay? It starts off as a little baby tick. This is known as a larval tick. And little baby ticks like little baby animals to get blood from. Okay? So this is where they would bite a infected mouse, pick up the Borrelia organism, and then also become infected. Okay? Now the way that these ticks grow is they take a big blood meal, then they fall off, then they sit and hang out for weeks at a time, and then molt and become a larger tick. Okay? So after the first blood meal, this larval tick gets infected, it molts, and then in one year it becomes a nymphal tick. Okay? Nymphal ticks are kind of, you know, teenagers of tick world, and so they're looking for a slightly bigger animal, and this is when they're likely to bite humans. Okay? After they bite the human, they get their blood meal, they fall off, they molt, become adults, then mate on the deer, um, and then make more eggs and continue the life cycle. Okay? Um, but <clears throat> it's this nymphal stage where we often see humans getting infected. And as you can see, there's one year where this doesn't happen. It's not until the second year early on, usually early spring, that we see a lot of these infections. Here is the erythemia migrans, or that bullseye rash. It seems relatively large, pretty easy to spot. If you get this and you treat with doxycycline, chances are you'll cure yourself of Lyme disease. But you have to treat it early. This is the Borrelia organism, it is a spirochete, which means it's well adapted for growing in the blood. Okay, and that's primarily where it hangs out. Infectious mononucleosis, also known as mono. This is a viral infection. It's primarily caused by Epstein-Barr virus, which is a herpes virus. Okay. Most of us get infected with Epstein-Barr EBV, about 70 to 80% of us. But not all of us will actually develop uh, mononucleosis-like symptoms. Okay, it really just depends on your immune system and uh, what flavor of virus you got infected with. It starts off usually um, by kind of a mild flu-like uh, symptoms and has a relatively long uh, incubation period of 30 to 50 days. And during this period, you are very, very, very tired. So one of the biggest problems with mono is that it just makes you tired and it's hard for you to focus and get things done. But generally speaking, it is not life-threatening. It doesn't cause any major problems. Uh, it's traditionally called the kissing disease because it's transmitted through contaminated saliva. Um, and most people get it in their you know, early adolescence when they start kissing more people. Hemorrhagic fever diseases. So hemorrhagic fever diseases cause hemorrhagic fever. Okay? What that means is you get a high-grade fever, and then your blood vessels become leaky, and so you start bleeding out of every uh, organ. And this can result in a serious condition where you lose blood pressure and then go into, you know, coma death. Uh, most of these, actually all of these, are um, viruses and they are transmitted primarily by mosquitoes. Okay? So yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes. It usually causes a, a pretty nasty fever disease, but not so much hemorrhage. The good news is, is there's a vaccine against this, so we don't really see this too often, uh, at least in developed countries. Dengue fever rarely causes hemorrhage, okay? it primarily causes a flu-like illness. Only a small percentage of the time does it cause hemorrhage. 
But what it does do a lot is it causes arthritic stance, which is basically severe joint pain. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so people that get this can have really bad joint pain that can last for years um, until it goes away. Ebola, which I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about, it's a virus that is primarily found in Africa. It is transmitted through contaminated fluids, primarily blood, uh, um, semen, urine, uh, vomit. And it results in severe hemorrhage in up to 100% of people that become infected. Okay? So it's a relatively serious infection. Now, uh, the good news for us is that because it causes such serious symptoms, it's relatively easy to quarantine people, and this slows the spread down pretty quickly. Okay? Just like we saw in, in 2014 when there was a big Ebola uh, pandemic. The scary thing about Ebola is if it does eventually mutate in such a way to where it's e easily transmitted in respiratory droplets, or it slows itself down a little bit so it's no longer 100% fatal, causes, or no longer causes serious symptoms, then that could be a pretty uh, important pathogen worldwide. Non-hemorrhagic fever diseases, so uh, these are exactly as their name implies. They cause high-grade fever without a hemorrhage. In fact, most of these we actually don't really see much anymore because of the advent of antibiotics. Okay? Brucellosis was primarily from uh, drinking contaminated uh, milk. Uh, cat scratch fever, people used to get from getting cat scratches. You still can get it, but it's very mild, easily treatable. Trench fever was in World War I. Don't see it too much anymore. The big one, though, that we still see a lot is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And that's because Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we're going to skip all the other ones. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is caused by a rickettsial organism. Rickettsia, rickettsia. And these rickettsial organisms are small intracellular bacteria. And whenever you have an intracellular bacterium, it becomes relatively difficult for the immune system to get rid of. Why? Well, once they're inside of the cell, they then are protected by that cell. Okay? And if it's a large cell, then the immune system can't even phagocytose it or get rid of it. This is primarily transmitted uh, via a, a tick, okay, so a biological vector, but it has been shown to, uh, uh, infections have occurred just through breaks in the skin. It has a two to four day incubation period. The first symptoms are fever chills, headache, muscular pain, and then you develop a distinctive red blotchy rash, okay? And that's why it gets its name spotted fever. Now, it's, Rocky Mountain is just where it was discovered, but it's primarily actually seen in the southeastern United States. Now, most people, this will self-resolve on its own. However, in some individuals, it will progress very, very rapidly. These, uh, uh, this rash will become big, open, oozing sores on the skin. This results in uh, a lot of problems uh, like necrosis, cardiovascular problems, convulsions, tremor, coma, and then ultimately. But it is a bacteria that is readily treatable with doxycycline. So if you do get a red blotchy rash, go to the doctor. And oftentimes, this can be treated uh, no problem. Malaria. So malaria is a protozoan disease. In fact, it's the most widespread protozoan disease in the world. Okay? It's transmitted, or it's caused by Plasmodium falciparum or Plasmodium vivax and it's transmitted through the Anopheles mosquito. Okay? The Anopheles mosquito is primarily found in the equatorial regions of the globe, and that's primarily where we see malarial infections. There are about 300 to 500 million cases of malaria, and about 2 million fatalities every year due to malarial issues. Okay? So it is a very widespread uh, pathogen, and it does cause significant <coughs> death around the globe. It's primarily controlled by either vector control or chloroquine. Uh, the Anopheles mosquito is a nocturnal eater, so one of the easiest ways to prevent, prevent malaria is to use a bed net while you're sleeping. Okay? It costs a couple bucks. But in places around the equatorial regions, oftentimes a couple bucks can be hard to come by, and so it can uh, be difficult for people to control the outbreak. Chloroquine is a compound that kills the malarial parasite, so you can take low doses of chloroquine, which prevent the infection altogether. But it is important to note that uh, malarial organisms have developed some resistance to chloroquine, so it doesn't always work as well as it should. So <clears throat> it starts off with a 10 to 16 day incubation period, 
And then the first symptoms that develop are very general malaise, fatigue, sore aches, and anomaly and diarrhea, very flu-like. Okay? However, what distinguishes it from the flu is the next symptoms, which are bouts of chills, fever, and sweating that occur every 48 to 72 hours. Okay? So you feel fine, and then they come back, 48 hours or 72 hours, then you feel fine, and then they come back. Okay? And this happens over and over and over and over. Now, generally speaking, the shorter the interval, the more serious the infection is, because you have a more virulent version of the organs. So this is an example of the malarial parasite. This is a blood stain. So what you see here are red blood cells, and what we call ring trophozoites, which are malarial parasites living within those red blood cells. So most of the symptoms associated with malaria are because these organisms are going into your red blood cells and slowly destroying them. Okay? So one of the biggest problems with malaria is something called anemia, which is where you uh, lose red blood cells. And if you have severe enough an uh, anemia because you have a lot of this organism present, then it can potentially kill you. Now malaria itself is a relatively complicated life cycle. Okay? It has both an asexual and a sexual phase. It starts off in the asexual phase, and this is where little baby malarial parasites called sporozoites are injected into a human through a mosquito bite. Okay? These sporozoites live within the salivary glands of mosquitoes. And so when a mosquito bites you, they'll inject a little bit of saliva to kind of stop coagulation. And in the process, they will infect you with the sporozoite. These sporozoites then go through the bloodstream and then target hepatocytes or liver cells. And once they infect a hepatocyte or liver cell, they then quickly divide and mature into merozoites. Okay. These merozoites are then, uh, they rupture out of the hepatocytes, leave the liver, and then infect red blood cells. Okay. The merozoites are primarily there to amplify the organism. One sporozoite can make thousands of merozoites. These merozoites then infect red blood cells, and they can do one of two things. They can either grow within the red blood cell, lysing the red blood cell, and releasing more organism. Uh, and these are often called ring trophozoites at this stage. Or they can become gametocytes. And gametocytes are the sexual stage of the malarial uh, life cycle. And this is where these guys just kind of hang out and lie dormant on a red blood cell, waiting for a mosquito to come, take a blood meal, suck up the gametocytes, where they then will mate inside the mosquito's gut, producing sporozoites, where they can travel to the salivary glands. Okay. So obviously I don't need, expect you to know all the details of the malarial life cycle. Okay. The big things I want you to take from this though is that it has both an asexual and a sexual phase, and it reproduces within the liver and the red blood cells in each Anthrax, so we've already talked a little bit about anthrax before. This is a bacterial organism known as Bacillus anthracis. And he can infect a whole bunch of different areas of the body. So the skin, known as cutaneous anthrax. The lungs, known as pulmonary anthrax. The GI tract, known as gastrointestinal anthrax. And then the, the brain of the meninges, known as anthrax meningitis. Now by far and large, the two most common forms are cutaneous and pulmonary. And pulmonary often gets into the bloodstream, and that's why we're talking about it in the flesh. So Bacillus anthracis is a gram-positive rod, and it is a very prolific spore former. Okay? What that means is it's very, very, very difficult to kill in the environment. And this is one reason why it is thought to often be um, a bio or could potentially be a biological weapon, because you could grow this organism up and make cytospores, and then you could literally blow it up in a bomb, it would survive, and then disseminate throughout that population. As I mentioned it, earlier, it is a, an animal reservoir. It's primarily found in uh, cattle and cows. And as we said before, cutaneous and pulmonary are the most common forms. Cutaneous <coughs> used to be associated with milk mates, you get cuts in their hands while milking, and then be infected that way. Pulmonary is very rarely seen in nature. Okay. This is often only associated with the bioterrorist variety of anthrax infection. It is important to note that it is pretty deadly, especially the pulmonary form. However, it is treatable with ciprofloxacin, okay, a particular type of anthrax. 
And so the United States has, you know, millions and millions of pounds of that stuff stockpiled in case this were to occur. Okay, so now the rest of this chapter is going to deal with HIV and AIDS. Okay? HIV is a pretty prolific pathogen, um, so your book wants to talk a lot about it. Also, it's what I study, so it's something we need to talk about. So, <clears throat> HIV is uh, a retrovirus, which means it's an RNA virus that converts itself into a DNA form. HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus, and that's because it causes immunodeficiencies, okay, or a weakened immune system. It does this because it targets what we call CD4 cells, and these are primarily T cells or macrophages, both of which are associated with the immune system. And so by targeting them, they destroy them, this severely weakens your immune system, and once this occurs, you develop something called AIDS, or the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Okay. AIDS is where your immune system is so weakened or immunocompromised because of the HIV virus that now you are susceptible to what we call AIDS-defining illnesses or relatively mild infections uh, in a healthy individual, but they become very serious in an AIDS patient because their immune system is so compromised. Uh, we think it is a hybrid virus from SIV, or Simian Immunodeficiency Virus. Um, this would probably occurred somewhere in the 1920s, 1930s in Africa, West Africa. And uh, I get questions all the time, and how did this actually happen? No, I don't think people had sex with monkeys. What I think actually happened is uh, people hunt monkeys, and you know, by doing so, they come into contact with the blood of the monkey. And all it takes is a little bit of a mutation in that monkey's virus, which then allows it to infect humans. <clears throat> now, the... the Disease associated with HIV tends to be pretty mild at first, and then it quickly can become pretty serious when your immune system becomes weakened. And the symptoms associated with HIV uh, are directly tied to two things. The amount of virus present in your body, as well as the amount of T cells, or CD4 T cells, that you have lost because of your infection. This can best be described in a little graph like this. Okay? In this graph, we have three lines. The green line, is the amount of virus present, the orange line, which is the amount of antibodies to HIV, and then the purple line, which is the amount of CD4 T cells. Okay. So initially you get infected, and once you get infected with the virus, it starts to grow like crazy inside of T cells. Your immune system hasn't responded to it yet, and so you get a very large amount of HIV um, virus being produced. Okay. This virus then it gets controlled somewhat by the immune system after about two weeks, and then quickly drops off. Okay? And you can see during this process, you lose you know, a big chunk of T cells, but not too much. Okay? During this first two-week process, where you have a lot of virus, and then it quickly drops off thanks to the immune system, most people develop no symptoms at all. However, some people will develop flu or mononucleosis-like symptoms. Now, once the immune system has come in, you have antibodies to HIV, it significantly decreases the amount of HIV virus present, and this is what we call the asymptomatic phase of HIV. At this point, you feel completely healthy, like nothing's wrong. And that's because the immune system is keeping the virus down to very low levels. But it is important to note that you are still infectious and you can still transmit the organism. Now, this asymptomatic period can last for years, sometimes even decades, depending on the individual. And then for reasons we don't fully understand, the uh, virus starts to quickly start to grow, even though the antibodies are still being produced to it. Okay? This increase in the amount of virus then causes a significant decrease of T cells. And once you get below 200 T cells per microliter of blood, this is when we consider you having, or excuse me, having AIDS. AIDS, or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, again, is where your immune system is so weakened you're susceptible to relatively minor infections, which then can become very serious. And this is then uh, ultimately what will probably kill you, uh, a secondary infection that your body can no longer uh, properly fight. So again, initial symptoms, very vague, if any. Um, it really just depends on the individual. And then eventually your immune system kicks in, keeps the organism at bay, the virus at bay, and you go through a long asymptomatic infection, which can last for years, sometimes 
And then one day out of the blue, the virus kind of picks back up, <coughs> starts to target CD4 T cells until there's less than 200 per uh, microliter of blood, and this is where you develop AIDS. Symptoms of AIDS are fatigue, diarrhea, weight loss, neurological changes, as well as obviously a severely weakened immune system. So when you have a severely weakened immune system, this opens you up to opportunistic infections. Remember, opportunistic infections are uh, infections that occur only when your immune system is compromised. Okay? These are organisms that would be completely harmless in a healthy individual. But because your immune system is severely uh, uh, compromised, the organisms get in, they grow like crazy, have a field day, and this can cause a very nasty infection. You also have uh, immune deregulation, obviously, hormone imbalances, metabolic disturbances, which are often associated with pronounced uh, a wasting of body fat, and it primarily leaves your face and your, your torso region, and then all kind of pools down in the body, causing very distinct uh, work. Protracted fever, fatigue, sore throat, night sweats, as well as lesions in the brain, meningitis, spinal column, peripheral nerves. This is known as hand or HIV-associated neurological dementia, which is where the virus actually starts to grow and reproduce in the room tissue. All of this results in a very nasty illness, which eventually uh, kills you. So here are just an example of some AIDS-defining illnesses. These are illnesses that either only occur in people who have severely weakened immune systems, or they occur in healthy people, but when you have HIV AIDS, they become much, much more serious. Uh, so an example of an infection that only occurs in HIV AIDS patients because they're severely immunocompromised is Carposi sarcoma. This is a herpes virus, uh, herpes uh, simplex virus 8. does not really infect healthy people because our immune system gets rid of it before it can. But if you have HIV AIDS, it gets in and it causes kind of these liver spots that can become cancerous and open up and ulcerate and things like that. Um, something else that isn't really you know, serious and, and healthy individuals, but as soon as you have HIV, can become very grave. This is herpes simplex virus, which causes cold sores, right? And most of us get this, it's not that big of a deal. But if you have chronic ulcers that last for one month and they're in the esophagus, that tells you something is not right, right? Your immune system isn't fighting it well enough, and so it's spreading and causing more serious illness. So a little bit about the virus. We talked about this guy uh, pretty detailed in chapter six, but hopefully remember that it is a retrovirus, which means it has an RNA genome, and this RNA genome can be reverse transcribed into DNA, okay, or converted into DNA. This process allows this DNA to become very stable. It can then integrate into the host cell's genome and then stick around with that cell for very long periods of time. And this is why we currently don't have a cure for HIV, because of this stable integration that develops. It infects cells that express CD4, which are primarily going to be helper T cells and macrophages of the immune system, both of which are very, very important for the immune response. And so if you get rid of those, uh, your immune system pretty much goes away. So a little bit about how HIV replicates. So it binds to the CD4 cell, it enters, releases its RNA, which gets reverse transcribed into DNA. Okay. This DNA then goes into the cell and integrates, or excuse me, into the, the nucleus, and integrates into the chromosome. Now, in most cells that this occurs in, this will quickly become transcribed and translated into HIV uh, proteins and viruses, which are then released. Okay. But in a very, very small fraction of cells, usually around 1%, the uh, HIV DNA goes into the nucleus, hangs out in the genome, but then doesn't do anything. It just sits there. And now that cell is infected, but it's not producing virus, so the immune system ignores it. And so now that cell can sit there for long periods of time without the immune system bugging it, and then 10, 20, 30 years later, this wakes up, virus gets made, and then big main boom, more virus is present in the body. So again, this is why there is no current cure to HIV. How is HIV transmitted? Well, it's transmitted through direct contact with contaminated bodily fluids. The contaminated bodily fluids are thought of as blood, semen, vaginal fluid, and breast milk. Okay, those are the four big ones. Saliva and urine 
generally do not have HIV in them unless you have cuts or infections in those areas. So because it's primarily transmitted through blood and sexual fluid, it is often uh, transmitted through sexual intercourse, uh, contaminated blood products, or IV drug use. Okay. And depending on what country you look at and the epidemic in that country, the amount of infections from each of these different uh, types of transmission can vary greatly. In the United States, most of HIV is transmitted through sexual intercourse, but if you go to a country like Russia, 80% uh, like of the infections are transmitted through IV drug use. Okay? So it really just depends on the culture and the norms and how things get transmitted. Yeah. Can a baby get it when they're born vaginally? So babies can get it from their mom. Uh, occasionally it can cross through the placenta, but this is extremely rare. Uh, most of the time where it's going to be transmitted to uh, a child is during vaginal delivery. But it's very easy to prevent. You treat with antiretrovirals during delivery, or you have a cesarean section. It reduces the likelihood of transmission by 95%. Okay. Um, but also, it can be transmitted through breast milk, and so babies can get infected through contaminated breast milk. And in first world countries, we don't see this too often because we've got plenty of formula and other ways of feeding our babies. Um, but in sub-Saharan Africa, where you can barely get water, let alone formula, it can be difficult to do anything but breastfeed. Okay, so that's where we still see those types of infection. Now, <clears throat> it's important to note that sexual intercourse in the United States is the primary way that HIV is transmitted, but the sexual uh, intercourse or type of sexual intercourse greatly determines how likely it's going to occur. Okay? Um, so men who have sex with men tend to have anal sex. This is much more traumatic. Um, so you've got about a 1 in 10 chance of getting it if you sleep with someone who has HIV. Heterosexual sex, because it's less traumatic, it's about a 1 in 1,000 chance. Okay? And that's if you're sleeping with someone who actually has HIV. So hopefully you see that HIV is actually relatively difficult to get. Okay? Um, but you never know when that 1 in 1,000 chance is going to be. It could be your first time or it could be your thousandth time. Welcome to statistics. <laughs> your thousandth time. Yeah. Huh? Your thousandth time. Thousandth person. No, not necessarily. That's how statistics is. It's kind of a crapshoot, right? So yeah. statistically, it's one in 1,000 times when you look at the entire population, right? Yeah. But it still could be your 10th time, and that just happened to be your unlucky time for that, right? Because all yeah. it takes is one. Right. Okay, so AIDS cases in the United States. Where do we see uh, AIDS, okay, or severe HIV? <laughs> so... Male MSMs, as I said before, these are men who have sex with men. These groups tend to be a little bit more promiscuous, and when they have sex, it tends to be anal sex, which means it's much more traumatic, and easily, uh, the virus is easily spread in the okay? So you can see 46 to 47 percent. Uh, this is the largest group, at least, in the United States. Okay? Injection drug users. These are users that, uh, or people that uh, use injection drugs, Oftentimes they share needles, okay? And by sharing needles, they then can you know, share blood, and this can result in transmission of HIV. What you see here is from 2000 to 2007, it goes from 25 down to 17%, and this is primarily because of harm reduction strategies, which basically are giving out clean, free needles to intravenous drug users to reduce the likelihood of transmission of a blood disease. MSMs, or men who have sex with men, and are injection drug users. You may ask, why do we section these people out, the poor uh, homosexual community who like to mess with them too much? In reality, that's not the case. The reason we look at these guys is because we call them the bridging population. So this is where you have a high-risk group, like MSMs, interacting with injection drug users who could be uh, heterosexual, and then could become infected and then transmitted to other heterosexuals through intercourse. Why does that one lower than the other one? Uh, the percentage. Lower than injection drug users? No, lower, lower than, than, than sexual contact. Yeah, that's too. I feel like they would be the highest. Yeah. Right. yeah. That would assume that there are a lot of MSMs who are injection drug users. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people who sexual contact that they're doing. There's a portion of them. So this is a proportion of MSMs, right? Oh. That are also injection <laughs> drug users, right? Okay. I'm sorry. And not all gay men are injection drug users. At least the last time I checked. <laughs> okay. So only a fraction of them, okay, six or five percent of that group, are injection drug users. 
And because they can share a needle with a heterosexual, they can then transmit it into the heterosexual population. Okay? And so that's why we call them the bridging population. Heterosexuals, you can see it's gone from 11 up to 31%. So we're beginning to see more and more in the heterosexual community. This is often in African American communities, the indigent populations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not trying to single anyone out here. I see you. Uh, there's a lot of. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, behavioral reasons for this. Uh, some of it can be uh, education, but also it, um, there's uh, a lot of stigma in the primarily the African American community uh, being homosexual. So a lot of homosexual African Americans will be on what they call the down low which means they are <laughs> heterosexual on paper, but then they sleep with men on the side, and then they can then become infected and <laughs> And then others, so others is just literally that. This is usually kind of flukes, so blood transfusion, hemophilia, you know, perinatally from mom to baby, you know, ran, relatively rare things, at least in the United States, but they still do occur. So how do we treat HIV? Uh, we treat HIV with heart or highly active uh, antiretroviral therapy. Okay? This highly active antiretroviral therapy targets specific portions of the viral life cycle. And this viral life cycle, uh, by targeting this, it then reduces the amount of virus produced and kind of keeps it in check. Okay? There are a couple different ways we can do this. We can target reverse transcriptase. We can target integration of the HIV uh, genome. We can target the production of HIV or maturation of HIV proteins. Um, and by doing this, we can greatly reduce the amount of virus being produced in an individual. Okay? So the way that we treat someone with HIV is we give them usually three antiretroviral drugs. Two of these guys, the nucleoside uh, inhibitors, and one of these guys, or protease inhibitors. And then you essentially take that for the rest of your life. What this does is it keeps the virus, or the amount of virus in your body, to very, very low levels so that you are no longer spewing virus out and it's infecting T cells and causing a weakened immune system. Okay? However, you have to stay on these drugs for essentially the rest of your life to prevent this virus from potentially waking back up, spreading, and causing uh, more serious illness. Okay? Does this work the same way as the proper? So PrEP drugs are essentially the exact same drugs, you're just taking them before exposure. So if you take them before exposure, the virus can't really establish itself, and it wipes it out before, okay. at least in theory. But are uh, these drugs killing everything else off? I mean, like, do they harm self? Uh, they used to. Uh, they got a lot better. So you can come out with great formulations and things. Uh, most of these drugs are pretty well tolerated by most patients. Also, this is a big, big, big place for pharmaceutical industries to develop, and so there are already, you know, hundreds of HIV drugs out there. So if you don't handle one well, there's usually another one that they can come by. Okay. It is important that you take the drugs every day and don't stop, because HIV is very, very uh, mutation prone. So what happens is, is if you stop taking the drugs for a little while, you remove that selective pressure, it then can start to grow, divide, and mutate. And then if you start taking your drugs maybe a week or two later, they might not work as well because of those mutations. Okay. Yes? So these are the drugs that they, didn't they just raise the price of them? Actually, I was just going to say they're expensive. So there's probably a lot of people who didn't take them for that time because they were so expensive. So they're basically like screwed for like the rest of the So what pharmaceutical companies do, because you have to take three drugs at a time, is they reformulate the drug. So the drugs are the same. They just combine them together or compound them. And then they can put a patent on it. So what you're thinking of is like Truvada, which is expensive because it's all three drugs in one pill that you take once a day and you're fine. But the actual drugs themselves, the mainstay drugs, the 20 that are used all over the world, are actually relatively cheap. Um, and there are plenty of programs all over the country that give these drugs out for free if you can't afford them. So it's just that one that they made, like mm -hmm. $500? Mm -hmm. So sometimes though they change like one little molecule in order to get around the patent. Like in India, I think they kind of make them and like change a little teeny thing about the drug. So it becomes very difficult because as soon as you change anything molecular about the drug, it then has to get reapproved by the FDA. Okay. 
So you can't fast track it because you say this change wasn't significant enough to cause any serious problems. But usually the best way to get around it, especially with this kind of combination therapy, is just to compound the drugs differently. And my other question was, uh, are there some people who are naturally resistant to HIV infection and why? They're called non-progressors, long-term non-progressors. Um, generally, they either lack um, a receptor required by the virus, so they can't cause productive infection, or their immune system keeps it at bay permanently. Um, and we look into those people, it's only about 1% of the population that are long-term non-progressors. And we look into them a lot to try to figure out what we can do or take from them to then utilize in a new patient to prevent infection. But a lot of times when we look at their antibody responses, they produce very funky, weird antibodies, which don't work well for most infections, but works very well for HIV. <laughs> so, you know, there's pluses and minuses to everything. Now, are they... Can they infect someone? Well, it depends. So if they have the antibodies, that means they're actively infected, and yes, they still can. Okay? If they lack the, one of the receptors, the CCR5 receptor, then no, because they've never been infected to begin with. Okay? It just depends on the type of infection. There's only been one person that's ever been cured of HIV that had, didn't have any of this. The bone marrow. Guy, and, right? Yeah, he had um, lymphoma at the same time, so they had to irradiate him and give him a bone marrow transplant. And when they did that, they transplanted in with uh, um, bone marrow that lacks CCR5, which is the receptor required for HIV infection. But it, it could still be hiding somewhere, kind of like you were describing last time, right? It can be, but it's been about mm, eight years now, and no one's ever seen anything. He gets poked and prodded all the time. However, it is important to note that bone marrow transplants suck. And so you have something called grass versus host disease which is where the new immune system that you just acquired from your bone marrow starts to attack every other part of your body, okay? And so he has neurological problems, he's got muscular problems, a lot of other problems associated with it. So it's definitely not a cure or a, a therapy that we can apply, but it was a proof of concept to show that you can cure, it's just that's not the way to do it. <laughs> The radiation. So if it was any other cancer, he probably would not have survived. But because uh, most lymphomas are relatively treatable, uh, especially if you irradiate and get new bone marrow, it's, it's definitely doable. Um, but if he had any other cancer, he probably would not have made it. Okay, so that's HIV. Now there are other retroviruses that can infect humans. In fact, there's just one type. And that's something called HTLV. HGLV likes to target either uh, B cells or T cells, and this results, instead of them being destroyed, them actually becoming cancerous. Okay? So this often results in lymphoma. Now, uh, we don't see this too often in most of the world. However, in um, small populations, usually in island nations, where you have kind of a, a heterogeneous um, genetic pool, as well as the virus is probably endemic in those areas, we tend to see this a little bit more often. Okay. But these both are relatively treatable, again, by irradiating and, and getting bone marrow. Alrighty, that's it for one. <coughs> Any questions?